In other words, we just stay wise. Are you guys showing any pictures or graphs today? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll probably have to zoom on that one for the graph. So easily would you use one? So if you want to... Well, if I push into that one, well, we can't push in, just have tights then, can we, if we... Right. So typically we have them over a little bit more, so then you can see both at the same time, and then whenever um, Dr. Wong or whoever points, they point to that one. Okay. So that we have that. Um, Let me back up some because I don't have. Okay. Well, hopefully they okay. point at that one. <laughs> cool. Yeah. They've always gone to the left. Um, everything I've ever seen. It's on a wine shop, that's all I'm going to notice. And just tell me when you're ready. I'm ready. Period. And you're ready to get as well? All right. Well, thank you all very much for coming today. Um, uh, before we get started on COVID, I, I uh, want to wish everyone a, a very uh, meaningful and impactful 19th of June. It is Emancipation uh, Day, the day that we celebrate the uh, uh, freeing of slaves. And what I would ask people to do, every person, is do something impactful. We're at a very special moment in our history where there is an opportunity uh, for real change. There's an opportunity to radically transform policing. Uh, there's an opportunity for us to build a more perfect union, but it takes all of us. We all need to listen. And we all need to uh, lead in our own way. I pledge to you that I, uh, 
will we'll, uh, lead on that issue by, by listening, by working with others. And uh, I would just ask people to show grace towards uh, one another uh, at this very important time in our country's history and in our uh, civil rights movement uh, together. Um, and now we'll, we'll move to COVID. Um, we have seen uh, quite an increase. I want to talk about that first and why, what we're going to do about it. Um, and so this is by far our toughest week uh, against COVID. Uh, we broke 400 cases for the first time uh, this week. We had a, a high of 413 cases in one day. And today we're reporting 394 uh, new cases. The last three days have been our highest three days of reported cases on record. And there was not one day this week where we reported less than 300 new daily COVID cases. And I just remind you that it was a week ago that we broke 300 and now we're at around 400. We lost several residents uh, this week and uh, people uh, as young as in their 30s, as old as in their 90s. Um, and we agree, I, you know, I agree with their families. Uh, we're also announcing the addition of four deaths uh, t today. That brings us up to a total of 311 of our neighbors who've uh, died from COVID. I don't, as we said a month ago, we don't want you to focus as much on new COVID cases and testing because we're going to try to do more and more testing. What we want to focus on is hospitalizations. And I don't know if we have a slide on that or not. I don't know if Peter uh, got us a slide on that. If, if that's, is that Phil's slide? I don't want to use Phil's slide. Okay, this is the one Peter did. Yeah, if you look at uh, uh, the slide, what you'll see, we picked a, a relatively high day from uh, a couple of weeks ago. If you actually pick, and I think Phil will have a slide uh, from the actual 14 days ago, where it is like a 154% increase. But what we've seen is we've gone from about a month where we were between 250 and 300 hospitalized cases to now today, um, two weeks later, having over 450 hospitalized cases. Why is that important? I don't have a slide for this, been too busy of a day, but I want you to, to think of hospitalizations, that's the apex, that's the, the top of the iceberg. These are the cases that are the sickest, right? And in order for that iceberg to double, okay, then the bottom of that iceberg of people out there sick in the community uh, has to expand exponentially. That's our challenge. There are a lot more people now out in our community that could get you sick. You may be one of them and not showing symptoms yet. So that's why we are moving into uh, a more aggressive stance to protect you uh, from, from COVID. That is the best way to save lives, to keep you from getting sick and to keep our economy moving. Um, and that brings us to our masking uh, uh, policy. So, and Phil will have more on the impact of the rise in hospitalizations. Before I move off that, let me uh, reassure you of one thing. We have enough hospital beds if you get sick today, all right? And we're going to have enough hospital beds if you get sick next week. Um, but our, our ICU capacity, our ventilator capacity, and our uh, hospital bed capacity is diminishing. We're getting more and more people in those things, right? And so what that means is we're okay for now, but when you're growing um, as fast as we're growing percentage-wise, obviously um, if you grow 60% over the next two weeks or 100% over the next two weeks, uh, it'll be four times as much as it was um, two weeks ago. And it doesn't take long when you're multiplying like that uh, for you to be in, in serious trouble at hospital beds. And it's never been the goal of science or the medical community or this local government uh, to fill as many hospital beds as we could. Um, it's been the goal to keep as many of you well and healthy as we, as we could. And so it's going to be up to all of us to, to do that. Here's what we know about masks. Mask, uh, have the, the talk on mask has evolved, okay? You can go back to March and you can find noted health experts saying, that based on their best guess about this new virus, this novel coronavirus, they call it, that the mask wouldn't do people much good. And then, then they said, yeah, you should wear it for other people. 
And now they say it is the single most effective way to uh, snuff out the, the coronavirus. What changed? What changed is, is they were able to do studies on this new virus, okay? They were able to get people into the lab, test, uh, you know, get subjects, test them, and, and uh, validate that across several medical schools and put that in what they call peer-reviewed, where all the other doctors look at it and try to pick it apart, journals, and what they found across several of those is that this was a very effective way to keep you safe. Now, we're not leading in this effort. We led, uh, Dallas County led, and other county judges um, in the state led um, on going to safer at home faster in our disease progression than any other place in the country. And as a result, um, we had a, uh, less deaths than the other big states and less disease than the other big states. Unfortunately, over the last uh, month, we have been shackled uh, from doing the things that we were able to do uh, up until the end of April. And we have now lost the lead here in Texas. We are the state with the most new cases of coronavirus. And sadly, we're the state with the most new hospitalizations of coronavirus. And we're this county is hitting records every day. And this week is hitting records every day. Just as I said, we're not. spread of coronavirus. And so we're simply following uh, the supermajority of states. Now that the governor has changed his position and allowed us to, um, you know, we were doing this actually for a few days uh, last month until the, the governor told us we had to stop. But now we're going to be doing that again. Let me tell you how it works. So in five days from now, um, the businesses will be required to have developed implemented a policy and they'll have a sign up to tell you what the policy is uh, to require masks at a minimum at their business. They can also require other things if they choose to. They can require their employees to take temperature as they come in. Do some of those things that were so effective when um, Dallas County was able to, to make the rules for the first uh, two months, they can implement those things as well and help uh, curb back the surge that we're seeing. But at a minimum, they'll, they'll do a masking policy. Um, you don't need to wait five days uh, for them, right? If you haven't been wearing a mask because you thought, well, I saw something on the internet but it wasn't all that effective, that's old news. The new news is that we are at record levels of coronavirus in our uh, region and in our county. Masks are the best way to keep you safe wear a mask. Uh, people will ask us, um, and um, some of the reporters may ask a few questions. Um, I haven't had much sleep the last couple of days working on this, so I don't want to play stump the band with you. But um, there are, you know, questions about, well, what if I'm eating in a restaurant? Well, there's an exception for that. Well, um, what about a business that has uh, indoor exercise? Um, so the businesses are working through all of those things, right? You can listen to what the business uh, tells you. The masks are required indoors in the business. Um, well, well not, eat, not indoors, but on a business premises, so it could be a farmer's market, uh, where people are going to be within six feet um, of one another, all right? And uh, so let me see if there's anything else on masking. Um, so, um, let's see, let me look at all the notes. Um, masking, of course, is not the only measure, okay? So when you're out away from your family, um, please 
maintain six foot distancing. When you're at high touch places, like a store where everybody's handling the same stuff or touching the same uh, turnstiles and things, uh, take some hand sanitizer with you. And we want to try to avoid, to the extent that we can, unnecessary trips. And I want to talk to you a little bit about child care centers. You know, we, sometimes we have these uncomfortable conversations. Please understand that I'm not trying to tell you how to raise your child or how to care for your child. But I do want you to know that we've seen a pretty sharp increase this week in COVID spread at child care facilities. The state yesterday removed the requirements that they had for safety at child care facilities. doesn't mean that the child care facility can't come up with some requirements for safety. It just means that the state isn't requiring it um, of them uh, at this time. But at a time when we're seeing the spread and more and more of us are going back to work and we, we have to use child care, a lot of us don't have that option um, of someone to stay home with our child. What should you look for as a, a parent in your child care facility? Well, masking, okay. Uh, now, children over 10 at the child care facility and the um, adults will be required to mask because at a child care facility, the kids are not going to be six feet apart all day. Um, but masking, you can, the CDC recommends masking people over the age of two. So you want to look for a child care facility or encourage your facility to mask the kids. You want to encourage your, and these are not Clay's ideas, these are the, what the doctors are telling me. You want to look for child care facilities where your kids stay with their group. So if your, your child is of a certain age with a small group, you want your child to stay with that and not commingle with many, many children. Um, you want to not have shared play equipment where your class and five or six other classes go use the jungle gym. Um, and you want the kids to eat separately and not in a large congregate fashion. There are other things that you can find too. We'll make those available on DallasCountyCOVID.org, but the CDC has a whole list of things uh, to look for and to, to push for as a, as a concerned mom or dad uh, with your child care facility to have your, your child's uh, you know, health first and foremost. Uh, so we do want to talk to you, uh, we want to, you know, kind of like, kind of like we did with nursing homes. As more and more kids are in the child care, we're going to see more and more spread. It's going to be important for you to weigh in as a good parent and, and, and drive those good changes to keep your child safe. Um, don't wait on the government. Uh, remember the local government is hamstrung by the, the, the governor's order on what we can do. We can only do what he's allowing us to do, but you can drive good changes. Um, so, um, you know, everybody is, has been doing their part. And I know we are all sick and tired of COVID. I'm tired of COVID, but this is a virus, right? It doesn't care that there's an important civil rights movement. It doesn't care that the presidential elections are coming up or that important things are happening in your family or in your work. It is a relentless virus that is seeking more and more people to infect. And so we have to keep our health at the top of our mind. These other important things need to be addressed as well, but our health must always be at the top of our mind. Uh, it is a week for bad news, unfortunately, but it does not change the fact that we'll get through this. And in the short run, I want to say to you what I say to my first responders every day at, at noon in closing our call. And that is, I need you to stay in the fight. So I need you to practice self-care. We've got Father's Day this weekend. We've got Juneteenth uh, today. Everyone, practice good social distancing, wear those masks around other people, but don't obsess over COVID all the time. We will get through this. We've gotten through worse than this before in this country. We're going to get through this, um, but I need you to practice self-care um, and uh, take a break uh, from this uh, so that you can keep fighting to keep your family safe. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Phil Wong. So I'm just going to quickly review some of the numbers and some of the monitoring that we're doing to see what risk level we are. Um, you know, as the judge mentioned, you know, today we're reporting 394 
new cases. Um, it's been our highest level, I think, yeah, the last three days, the three highest reported we've ever had. We had over 400 and um, earlier this week, and now 400 around that range seems to be our new normal. Uh, our total number of cases then that we've reported is 16,042, and then the four deaths that we reported today, so again, 311 deaths. Um, you know, and just to review some of the numbers, um, we are still at the red zone. Oops, yeah. We are still at the red zone um, in terms of risk level. Stay home, stay safe. Um, we haven't seen, as we as I'll show you. Uh, you know, again, we've been looking for that decline, that steady decline. 14 days um, of uh, decline, and we have not seen it. We are so. Next slide, please. Um, when the looking at uh, COVID-19 suspected. ER visits in the last 24 hours. Uh, you can see the last two days are the highest numbers we've ever had since this started. Um, the yellow line is sort of that trailing average. Uh, certainly since um, uh, June 10th, 11th, uh, around that time, steady increase. Um, and, you know, talking to some of the ER physicians, uh, it's very extremely concerning what they're seeing on the ground level out there. Uh, you know, again, uh, sometimes we're sunny outside, don't see this, but this is what's uh, being seen in our healthcare settings right now. Uh, next slide. Uh, available ICU beds. Uh, that's one that you don't want to be going down because that means there are fewer beds uh, being available. And as you can see, there's been sort of a steady decline in that number. And um, uh, so we're uh, watching that. Uh, next slide is these are the uh, hospital, general hospital admissions, uh, those suspected COVID-19 general hospital admissions uh, within the last 24 hours. Uh, again, the last week you can see a couple of our highest days ever, uh, that trend uh, continuing to go up. Uh, I'll have a blow up of that in, in a little bit, but just when you look at the last week, uh, how that's been increasing. Next slide is ICU admissions, again, showing those uh, critical care, those requiring uh, critical care in the ICU um, since June 11th, uh, steady increase, and, and again, um, uh, concerning levels of this that we're seeing. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, the uh, hospitalizations, the census numbers, and these, as you can see today, um, is reported the highest number of uh, confirmed uh, general hospitalizations that we've had throughout this. Uh, and then uh, 300 confirmed, it was 26 from the prior day, uh, which was one of our, uh, was I think our second highest yesterday. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the confirmed uh, COVID-19 ICU hospitalizations. Again, the last three days, the highest that we have ever seen since this. Um, 149 confirmed uh, hospitalizations. Um, and so, again, very, very alarming, concerning numbers uh, from what's going on in the, um, in the healthcare setting. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the number of deaths. Uh, this, you know, we have some lagging behind that. It's, it's low, it is lower on this. And one of the things that, um, you know, we're looking at in terms of some of the cases, uh, some of the hospitalizations uh, might be in younger persons. So we are seeing fewer deaths, which is indicating um, you know, some change in some of the demographics of who's getting uh, the COVID infection. And as the judge mentioned, uh, you know, daycare settings, and yesterday we reported there were 17 cases in nine different daycare settings. Um, the main message from that is that this is affecting our entire population. It's not just nursing homes and older people. I think that, um, you know, the fact that it's in the daycare settings, it's uh, the children, as well as some of the workers in the daycares, uh, those are important populations that, uh, you know, are being affected by this also. Next slide. Um, this just uh, summarizes the last seven days of the total general hospitalizations and ICU admissions. Uh, and, and this is for all of the counties uh, combined. You can see, uh, again, record numbers uh, throughout the region in terms of our total hospitalizations. And as we've had some calls uh, with some of the hospital administrators, again, starting to get to be, you know, alarming, concerning uh, levels that we're seeing with this. This is something that's on our website. You can see uh, leading causes of death or causes of death uh, over time, but starting out earlier in April, uh, start COVID was down at the bottom. Uh, as we get to April 20th, 23rd, moving up, uh, continues to move up as one of the leading causes of death uh, in our uh, Dallas County. 
uh, getting into mid-May, uh, end of May, into June, and this is now up to present time. So as you can see, for those that are questioning, well, you know, this is just, this is like flu or something. The number of deaths now that we've had in Dallas County, it is now the third leading cause of death already. And this is, and you're thinking, this just started in March. This is since, you know, like a little over three, almost four months that we're talking about. And now COVID has become the third leading cause of death. So um, again, it, it's something that it is so important for people to not take their eye off the ball on this, to be vigilant. And um, as the judge mentioned, and we, uh, the physician, the public health group, uh, the infectious disease physician uh, committee, uh, you know, really appreciates the leadership of uh, Judge Jenkins and the commissioner's court in passing the uh, order on the facial coverings, cloth facial coverings. Uh, and um, because it is had, we now have this increasing recognition of how important that can be for our being able to control the spread of infection. Um, it is one of the most important things that has come out because of that now recognition of how asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic spread before people even know they have any uh, COVID or they even show symptoms, that that period it can be very critical for spreading that through the droplets and some of the aerosol, aerosols. And the cloth facial, facial coverings can really prevent that spread to other people. And if everyone uses this, if there's universal usage of this, then this has been shown and there's more scientific evidence showing the impact that this will make on our control of this. And so it really, we, you know, again, earlier on, as we were opening up, uh, we were starting, we, things had plateaued, they weren't going up. And we were encouraged that people were still being vigilant, were still staying, at, you know, sheltering in place and um, teleworking and using the cloth facial coverings. But I think since Memorial Day, we started to see more relaxation of that, more opening up and people forgetting about it. And this is what is being reflected here. But now that we have, if people will do the universal uh, cloth facial coverings, this is probably our pathway that we can get to opening up the economy and our community in a safe way. And this is what we all want, as the judge mentioned, we all want to go from red to orange to yellow to green. We want to as much as anyone. And this seems to be a pathway. It's a, it seems like a pretty good trade-off if we can, if everyone will wear the mask and then we can start opening up things in a safe way, that seems like a pretty good uh, trade-off and a, a, a path for us to accomplish that. Well, again, there was the report of the 12-year-old uh, being investigated by the medical examiners. And, and, you know, this is all along we've said that, it, and we've had some, uh, you know, um, a range of ages that have been reported. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the message really that it can affect all ages, that it's not just something for, uh, you know, older people and that that's the only group that can have serious illness. And, and we keep learning every day more and more about what are the long-term effects of this and consequences. And um, so, uh, again, I think the message would be that everyone needs to be concerned about it, all ages, and it can affect uh, all ages. I'm going to repeat the question uh, since he's not Mike. Uh, the question was about masking. As businesses do their uh, their plans, where should they look uh, for guidance? Um, and that's a great question. Um, I will tell you that uh, today, in speaking in favor of the mask, 
uh, the Dallas Regional Chamber of Commerce, the Dallas Citizens Council, the Texas Retailers Association, the Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce, and uh, several large businesses like AT&T and HEB, as well as uh, so, uh, you know, people representing small business, all spoke in favor of this. So any of those, particularly those organizations, those chambers and citizens council, are great places for businesses to talk amongst themselves. You can also send business inquiries. What's, where are they sending those uh, to, to us? What's the, judge, but there, it's also on the website, the order itself. The order itself has a lot of guidance, and then you can send your questions to DC Judge at Dallas County, to DC Judge at Dallas County. Uh, dot org. We're in communication with our counterparts in the uh, in the large urban areas. Uh, with I'm in communication with TC Broadnecks uh, here locally and others, um, and so uh, we want to help as much as we can. We're confident businesses will follow this because they've asked for it. They came with health care and and asked for it. They're the ones that lobbied the governor to flip back to where he was two months ago. Um, and allow these things to happen on mask. So I'm um, uh, not too worried about uh, them coming up with, uh, with good guidance. And, and largely, uh, we want to help them, but I'm confident that each business that cares about their employees and cares about their customers, so that gym that has that unique workout, they'll find the best way for them. Another gym will find a, a different path for them. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, I'd be remiss, by the way, when we're talking about masking if I did not um, laud the leadership of Elba Garcia and Teresa Daniel, uh, who um, uh, stood up to, you know, frankly, some abuse today, um, but uh, led on this issue and I think will be responsible for saving countless lives. Are there any other questions before we wrap this up? Okay, Judge, can you just run it for us? Like, I mean, which places this apply to, and then also, I mean, who's going to be making sure that they're actually following? I got the second part, but the. So, do you mind just running it for us? Like, yeah. what places this applies to? Because there's still a lot of like confusion. Does it apply to the offices, oh, restaurants, okay. and so, who's going to be? Uh, right now, I understand. So the question was, uh, to what type of establishments does this apply, and then who um, will be checking on that? Um, so, um, to what sort of establishments does it apply? It applies to all commercial businesses. So businesses that make money, whether it be a, you know, a, you name it. If you make money, you're a commercial business as opposed to a charity, uh, this applies uh, to you. And then who will be looking uh, into this? It won't be the police. We're not sending out the mask police to uh, uh, go talk to our businesses. It'll likely be some code enforcement people, and when they see that the, you know there's not that many of them, but if they're out of business and they see something, um, what I'd ask is that we just talk to the business about ways to improve. And this is not going to be a revenue source thing. Our businesses, these most of these are essential businesses largely, who have kept our economy moving. Their employees have risked uh, their lives, frankly, to keep our economy moving and and they very much want you to wear a mask around those essential employees so the last thing we're going to do is be confrontational uh, with our partners the business community that have kept you all kept us all fed and uh, kept our economy moving thank you all very very much uh, for being here today and um, again do take a, a break from this do remember since it is juneteenth do something impactful it's a special moment in our history of this country, but we can miss it if we don't all come together and radically change the way we police and the way that we uh, see each other and hear each other. God bless you.